Hey there, I'm John Sterling. Welcome to Noob School. This is where you learn a lot about how to get started, put your best foot forward in sales, and I'm bringing in folks that have already done it. Today, I've got Michael Pace. Michael is one of the, one of the all-time greats I've worked with. Uh, Michael started with me just out of Walford College. He was a star baseball player. <laughs> you were, you were a star yeah. baseball player. That's, that's what the resume is. My right? mother's eyes. That's right, that's right. And uh, I'll never forget, Michael was a, uh, he was a assistant baseball coach <clears throat> at Wofford when I interviewed him. So he'd already graduated and he was working as a coach, working his way up the ranks, I guess. And I offered him a job working for our company in sales. And he accepted the job and he's like, he goes, are you sure I got this job? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, you have just quintupled my salary. <laughs> so uh, I'm glad you joined us, Michael. Thank you, John. I'm, I'm very glad I did as well. <laughs> and so uh, it was the start of uh, a lot of fun and a great career so far. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So tell us about the beginning, like like how we first met, your interview, and what it was like starting in sales with DataStream back then. Well, as you mentioned, John, I was coaching baseball, and I was making uh, $350 a month before taxes. And... Um, I realized, uh, although I grew up with a coach and a teacher, re respect him tremendously, I just said I need to get out. The ends weren't meeting like I thought yeah, I wanted yeah, them to. Yeah. And so it, we interviewed. Um, I was at a bachelor party, met Dustin Caldell. He said he was working with you. I said, well, I know the Sterlings. Don't yeah. know John, but I'm yeah. going to go try to get an interview. Yeah. So I got the interview. Uh, one of the questions you asked me, which I'll never forget, and was, well, how much do you want to make in your first year? And I'd interviewed with the banks, and um, I said, well, I'd like to make somewhere between twenty-one and twenty-three thousand dollars a year. Yeah, and you look me dead in the eyes. You goes, "If that's all you make, I'll fire you." Yeah, and I was like, "This is the place for me." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, that's a good. You know, we talk about this in the book a little bit, but it's a good <clears throat> point. Michael was a great baseball player and had a good education, but at that moment, he met me. Did not have. He would not talked to a lot of potential job uh, uh, hiring folks. So he talked to some banks, but he didn't know. What was out there so our opportunity he matched up perfectly with us and we we're happy to to give him that big the big raise um now that was a while back that was a, it was a few years ago tell us about you know what you're doing now what you've evolved into because i know well back up a little bit i know when you were with us you went through inside sales inside sales management and then uh we had an opportunity to open up uh an office in mexico and we had nobody down there we just thought we ought to be in Mexico and have, have a presence. And I said, Michael, we'd like you to go. Mm -hmm. Open oh, up. How old were you then? <laughs> I was uh, 24 when we started talking about it. I was 25 when we moved. Yeah. yeah. I was so on. he's like, why me? Why <laughs> me, John? And I'm like, because you can speak Spanish. I saw it on your resume. I'll never forget. It said minor Spanish. No, it was, it was a major. I had major, double major. Double Business major. Econ in Spanish. Yeah. And I was not fluent. Yeah. Far well, that's from what you it. said. You said you said it doesn't just because you majored in Spanish doesn't mean you can speak it. <laughs> that's right. And it, I said, well, you're close. You're closest. It, uh, yeah. It, 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 you know, it was an opportunity of a lifetime. No idea what in the world to do. Um, so I turned to an uncle, and because you said bring together a business plan. Yeah. So I turned to my uncle who had done some international business. Said, will you send me whatever your company has? Yeah. And about relocation packages and everything. Yeah. So I pulled it all together, gave it to you. You met with Larry and said, all right, y'all go do it. <laughs> so I had to go home and tell my wife she was quitting her job. Oh, my God. And on my first wedding anniversary, I was on the way to Mexico, and Devin was back at home packing up our house, selling our two cars and moving. I'm glad it worked out. Because, I mean, that could have been a disaster. <laughs> that could have been a disaster. Yeah, but being away for your first year of marriage really makes you work things out. You can't good. turn to others. But yeah. So there were a lot of... A lot of good lessons you can't learned. run to your sister's house. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's good, man. That's good. And, and then since then, you know, you had a great career in uh, growing Latin America for, for our company, for DataStream, <clears throat> including an acquisition down in uh, Buenos Aires in Argentina, the, the wonderful Carlos, Carlos Bellotti. Bellotti. Yep. Bellotti. Mm -hmm. That was great. We love Carlos. Uh, he's, he's, after he sold his company and worked for us for a while, he went on to like work in the, the IT part of the government, didn't he? Did mm -hmm. he, run? he was one of the IT directors appointed by the president of Argentina, Argentina for a period of time. That's pretty cool. Yeah. 
So Michael did all that for us, international, inside sales, outside sales, management. <clears throat> um, and then since then, I know you stayed with the company for a while. At one time, Michael had 40 salespeople working for him with no managers, which I'm not sure that's recommended, <laughs> but I think we were trying to save money. <laughs> Um, here we're propping it up to sell is what was and happening. Were we? <laughs> yeah. I forgot about that. Um, but but tell us about where you are now and kind of how how you got there and what that organization looks like. Right when M4 acquired DataStream, I'd been in DataStream at the time about 14 years, which is unusual in the software world. And then so I remained for the next six. And what they realized was that DataStream had a great inside sales model. Yeah, and they had thousands and thousands of customers that they could sell a lot of software to over the phone. Right. And so they, we started building out a larger inside sales organization supporting all the solutions that they had globally. And when I had left there six years later, the team was about 200 employees total wow. worldwide. Yeah. And, um, and then I followed a, uh, one of the senior vice presidents to Pitney Bowes as part and to build out their inside sales team, mm -hmm. uh, demand generation team, and then um, have done the same thing. One of the CEO, or the CEO that was of N4 is now the CEO at Avanti, where I am, mm -hmm. and so I'm responsible for all demand gen sales development teams globally. globally. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, <clears throat> for the listeners out there, this is what I'm talking about. I mean, any of you would look at Michael Pace right now and say, gosh, I want to be like him, right? I would like to just jump right to that spot. Well, <clears throat> it's possible to get there, but you don't get there immediately, but you have to make some good decisions, including getting in the right job, taking the opportunity when it presents itself, like moving to Mexico when you can't speak the language. I mean, you know, I mean, there's some things that you have to do along the way, but <clears throat> the book will tell you if he that if he'd have gone to work for a, this, let's just say the wrong company, let's say if, if Michael would have gone to work for a bank, he'd probably be a good banker right now, but he wouldn't be running global sales for some billion dollar company like he's been doing consistently uh, over the past probably 10 years he's had that job. So that's that's part of the reason we're doing this podcast. So Michael, this is, this is perfect. Um, it leads me to a very important question um, the Colby is one of the things we talk about, the Colby scores. And I think all the salespeople, it drove them crazy. I was so nuts about these Colby scores. But in the book, Colby.com, just a simple test you can take online that will show you, uh, from our perspective, <clears throat> where you line up best with a, with a, in the sales world. Michael's numbers line him up best, believe it or not, to be a sales manager. Okay, the weird thing about that is, of course, he's become a great sales manager, far better than I ever was. He's perfectly suited to be a manager. He struggled in straight sales. And I don't mean like he was terrible, but he was not the very best salesperson. Would you agree with me on that? Uh, well, for the first six months, but then after my first full 12 months, yeah. I was number one on the board, John. Yeah. Well, it does not fit my narrative. <laughs> no, no. It, I, I, I love sales. But I, I like coaching people. Yeah. And and what like I learned, coach, kind of. what I learned yeah. was that I can be a coach, just doing it in a different fashion yeah. than on the field, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But and the Colby is important. Just back to your point, yeah. is the what I've learned is hire people better than you, mm -hmm. right? And 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 hiring is one of the most important things that you can do in terms of getting the right people on board. And by using the Colby you're really able to narrow that down. I mean, this was happening before I got there, yeah, obviously, yeah. but we refined it over a period of time with more and more people coming yeah. into the organization. So I think it, that and or other type of tool to yeah. limit your mistakes yeah. is huge. Yeah, and I would agree with you. I'm sure you've used multiple tools. It, it just the consistency of using something right. that helps you figure out, my best people kind of look like this and the people who don't work out kind of look like this. Let's get them in the right spot. That's right, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's talk about some of the things that you did when you started. This is for the sake of, of the noobs, for our readers <clears throat> and, and some of our listeners. What would you tell them not to do that slows you down? Don't rely just on yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, don't work nine to five. Yeah. Um, when you get really good, you know, 
work one to six, but mm-hmm. uh, but come in early and, and stay late. But don't rely on yourself. What I mean by that is that there's a lot of people that are good at selling, and there's people within your organization, there's people outside of your organization, there's books, there's podcasts, you know, whatever it may be. Go take advantage of those. Learn from the mistakes they made so that you don't make them. It'll help you go f- move along faster. Because I was slow my first five months mm-hmm. trying to do it alone. Mm-hmm. So reach out more, multiple sources. It's already been done. That's right. That's yep. good. That's a good one. And then what are some of the things that you did do that helped amplify your success that you'd want to pass on to others? Um, I, I joked about not working nine to five, but I knew I was, I knew nothing about sales. So I had to come in early and stay late, but my peers were doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. So it didn't seem out of the ordinary. Yeah. Um, and I learned to, um, get folks in the boat with you, whether it's a sales engineer to help you position the solution or whether it was your manager to help negotiate the deal. The more people you get in the boat with you, the better your outcomes are going to be. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't work out, everybody knows that you put your best foot forward and it just wasn't, wasn't the right opportunity right. for you to win anyway. Right. right. So I think get people in the boat with you. Bring in help. <clears throat> yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a good one. That's a good one. Um, and then, you know, one of my favorite things – talk about is head trash you know things that we think are true for whatever reasons that turn out not to be true for example um you know i used to always hear when i was a kid it's not polite to talk about money and so you know it kind of makes you walk on eggshells around money with business people Mm -hmm. you know obviously we want to get to the point with them about talk about money make sure it makes sense so do you have any of those in your world that you've recognized that we could pass on well, I think it's just the intimidation, especially at a young age for, for a noob, um, is I'm 24. I'm going to go in to talk to the owner of this business that's been doing it 30 years and yeah. he's 55. Yeah. What can I tell him that he doesn't know, right? It's yeah. that you have to go and do your – so that's the head trash is the lack of confidence yeah. or disbelief that you can go and do it. And so I always have said if you prepare, so you study, you do your homework, you learn about their business, you learn about how your solution compares up mm-hmm. to what, what they may be doing, and you match those two, and you tell a good story about where you've been successful doing it before, they'll typically listen at least. You right. get in the door, and then that's when you bring in the horses with you, right. and then you open up and, and um, close the deal eventually. Yep. So just <clears throat> the head trash there is I'm too young to have a conversation with a serious buyer or older. Absolutely. Okay. It, it just creates, it uh, erodes confidence is what happens because you just start spinning in a si- you know, spiral. Yeah. And um, that's how you can overcome it though. Okay. So <clears throat> big finish here. What's the, what's the best like piece of advice you'd want to pass on? Um, to a noob yep, would be to, noob. to um, is to find a, a solid mentor who you can turn to and then they give you guidance or mentors, doesn't have to be one. Mm-hmm. Um, in the world of business, number yep. one, yep. Um, in the world of uh, sales specifically within business. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you can do those two things and learn both sides and they can help you avoid some mistakes, you'll be more successful long-term and more quickly, I think. Get a mentor, that's yeah. good, that's good. Um, and lastly, what's your favorite word in the English language? <laughs> uh, compete. compete. I would say compete. Okay. Um, so if you go in thinking competition and wanting to win, within ethical measures, uh, you'll do what you can to be successful. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you do what you can to be successful um, or you give it your best, um, your outcomes will be better, more, Good. most likely. Good. I love it. I love it. <clears throat> well, thanks for being on the show. It's been exciting. I thank you for making me a part of this. Uh, it's exciting. I uh, look forward to seeing some of the other ones that will be coming down the road, well, especially Mimi. Yeah, she'll be here soon. <laughs> Watch out for her. So uh, so thank, thanks to all the listeners for tuning in to Episode 1, Noob School. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>